Stephen Jenkins is an ordained deacon in the Free Church of England, a Reformed Episcopal Church, which has its origins in the ministry of George Whitfield and the Great Awakening. The Bishop Primus of the Free Church of England has sent him as an ecumenical emissary to all North American churches. Stephen's been presenting regularly to senior adults at Highland Park United Methodist Church for four years. As a dual national, he interprets British history and culture, trying to emulate the style of the late, great Alastair Cook. He presents extensively in London and Los Angeles, but he enjoys returning to his adopted home here in the city of Dallas. Please welcome Stephen Jenkins. Thank you, Richard, for that uh, introduction. Uh, good evening or good morning or whatever time you're going to be viewing this, everybody. Um, the subject of today is the historical and cultural background to the Netflix series for The Crown, which airs November the 15th. Um, all 10 episodes are going online. Now, I know many of you are, have already watched the first three, and some of you are very avid fans of it. And so I, um, I have done this with all three series before, given the cultural and historical background, in order to uh, help you understand uh, and appreciate the series and enjoy the series uh, just that little bit more. The series four will go from 1979 until 1990. And uh, three women, three very different women, uh, dominated uh, that particular decade. And you can see who uh, is portraying them there. So, of course, it will be Princess Diana, Queen Elizabeth II, and Prime Minister Margaret, uh, Margaret Thatcher. And um, Olivia Colman is carrying on her role of portraying Queen Elizabeth II. And Emma Corrin is going to be Princess Diana. And um, Gillian Anderson will uh, enter the series as Margaret, uh, Margaret Thatcher. Someone once described the crown as an upmarket Dallas. Of course, it's much more than that because mainly it's based on historical fact. Um, the person writing it, uh, um, Peter Morgan, um, has done extensive uh, work and research on this. He's a very good writer. Uh, of course, the, he had to write into some scenes what he thought would have been said, knowing the character uh, of the people. Um, it was once uh, a royal historian was asked, why are the Americans so uh, interested in the royal family? Well, let me tell you, it's just coming across from England, in, the English people are just as interested in your election as you are in the royal family. Uh, but the reply to that particular, particular question is of why Americans are so interested, or in fact some people besotted with the royal family, even considering the fact that after all uh, their efforts to get rid of King George III, uh, this historian replied to that question neatly when he said, it's about the fairy stories that keep it going. Whoever heard of a girl kissing a frog and it turning into a senator? So that introduces it, but let me just say that um, in this period of time we're going through, to a certain extent we're looking back on the 80s, to a certain extent it is nostalgia, a kind of yearning for better times, um, and it is a celebration of good times experienced in the past, which in situations of stress, as we have now, can actually be very therapeutic. So I hope that you do enjoy the presentation and it enhances your enjoyment of it. The year is actually, I said at the beginning, 1979. It's actually 1977. That's where the series starts. And here you see the Queen on one of her uh, favorite walkabouts. It's the Silver Jubilee year. The Queen has been Queen for 25 years. Became Queen, uh, was crowned in 53, became Queen in 1952. And here she is walking the streets on something which was an innovation of her and on her own idea. 
she started to do these walkabouts which involve her greeting a lot of people, meeting a lot of people, thousands upon thousands of people, with, with no regard to her own safety and getting very close to people, not just in England, but all over the world on the extensive trips that, that she has done. Uh, during this Silver Jubilee year, she was extremely busy. Um, she visited Australia, New Zealand, the Pacific Islands, India, Canada, the West Indies. And then I have some personal memories of the actual Silver Jubilee Day, which marked the 25 years. What they did was they lit bonfires, right, which is traditional, right across the country. And this goes right back to her predecessor, uh, Queen Elizabeth I, Henry VIII's daughter. And a bonfire would be lit at one end of England, and then every mile or so another bonfire would be lit in the dark, and it would, it would traverse through uh, the whole country. So I remember that, and I also remember it was pouring with rain, uh, which is, the Queen is um, famously unlucky for royal occasions. It was pouring with rain on her coronation, and she doesn't have that much uh, luck with the weather. So those are the walkabouts, um, all the rest of the royal family up to and including uh, Meghan Markle, all the rest of the royal family continue that tradition wherever they go of meeting the people up very close. It provides nightmares for security, I know. The only person who doesn't shake hands amongst the whole royal family is Princess Anne. She doesn't particularly like them uh, doing them, but she does them and she doesn't not shake hands, not because she's not friendly, but I, I would suspect because she had a very bad experience once she was driving near Buckingham Palace and an armed person, when the car was stopped, broke into her car and with a gun threatened uh, her and uh, her husband and the, the police had to tear him away. So uh, she, uh, maybe that's at the back of her nine as, as she goes along. That the next picture uh, is from 1982. Here we have the Royal Marines yomping across the Falkland Island, Islands. Um, the, the Falklands had been retaken uh, from the Argentinians and the Royal Marines were due to be helicoptered from one end of the island to Port Stanley, the capital, to support the paratroopers who had just uh, taken it back from the Argentine army. Poor Argentine army. Mainly they were conscripts and young boys, um, and they really didn't stand that much of a chance. But they did put up quite a fight, and they inflicted a lot of casualties, as did the Argentine Air Force on British ships which were surrounding the Falklands. So these um, Marines, which you see, had yacht, that's what they call it, 56 miles, with a backpack of 80 pounds equipment on them. And you can see the, the, apparently this is not a stage photo, the Marine at the back is very patriotic and he had heard over the radio that his co-soldiers, the paratroopers, had just taken Port Stanley and the Falklands had been liberated. So he, he hung that flag on the back of his backpack and apparently he still displays it in his, in, in his house now. Uh, interestingly enough, um, there was some, a lot of cooperation between the United States and Britain on diplomacy, trying to convince General Galtieri to, to um, give up the Falklands after he'd invaded it. And publicly, uh, the American government said they wanted to be impartial in this. Uh, they had some leaning towards that because trade with South America was very, very important. But uh, secretly, they reassured Britain that they were going to do everything they could uh, to convince General Galtieri to leave the uh, islands. But of course, he didn't. And Margaret Thatcher was um, not easily swayed on, um, on the invasion. And the invasion went ahead. It was a difficult invasion. Now, here we have Prince Andrew. Uh, now, lately, he's uh, been having a, a tough time. Uh, partly due to himself, I think, and the way he's behaved, etc. Although, of course, uh, we mustn't gossip, and that nothing of that has been absolutely proven. 
Uh, but here he is, he's a helicopter pilot in the Royal Navy, and he, at that time, in 1982, he was second in line to the throne after Prince Charles. Um, he, he was serving uh, in the Royal Navy as a helicopter pilot, and he went to the war, and what he did, as the other helicopter pilots did, they tried to protect, to protect the shipping, the large fleet that went down there with equipment and men and soldiers from the Argentine Air Force. And actually he was quite brave in that because what the helicopter pilots did is they would be act as decoys. Uh, they would send out flares to try and redirect the Exocet missiles which were being uh, fired by the Argentine planes. Some of those Exocet missiles uh, landed and uh, several ships were lost and hundreds of sailors were, were killed. Uh, but they, he actually, and all the other helicopter pilots, took their life into their own hands because they could have been deflecting the Exocet missile into, into their own helicopter. Well, interestingly enough, um, one of the women who accused him of being inappropriate remembered that he was sweating profusely in a nightclub. That's how she remembered uh, him uh, when she gave her testimony uh, to the American authorities. But apparently, Prince Andrew does not sweat. Also, Queen Elizabeth apparently does not sweat. That might be hereditary thread. It's actually a medical condition called anhydrosis. And um, he explained that he felt that he had got this condition because of the, the nerve-wracking experiences that he had, had had during the Falklands War. So that uh, brings it up to date there. His two daughters, Beatrice and Eusini, have recently been married in St. George's Chapel, Windsor Castle. And to really update you on Prince Andrew, he apparently wants to resume his royal duties um, after having relinquished them or being told to relinquish them by the Queen. We're not exactly sure which of the two, but he did relinquish his royal duties. But he wants to carry on doing some, and I don't know what form that's going to take. Here we have the Falklands Military Parade. We have Margaret Thatcher and government ministers, a couple of admirals. This was very controversial because um, the Queen is the head of the armed forces in the United Kingdom. It's she that puts out the commissions for officers by royal appointment. And traditionally in the past, victory parades, so like the one after World War II, were, uh, the one after World War II was taken by the Queen's father. Princess Elizabeth was there, her mother. Um, not the Prime Minister, but Margaret Thatcher insisted that she take the victory parade. And there you can see her in the center with one of her, her hats as the tanks roll by and everything. It looks a little bit like a scene out of the um, military parades going past the Kremlin, actually. It's, it was a kind of very un-British thing and there was a lot of controversy about having a victory parade um, because, after all, it really wasn't like World War II and the defeat of Hitler. Um, so, but uh, Margaret Thatcher insisted on having it for, for the military and the task forces. And there you can see her there. And this is a part of her speech which she made, which you might like to hear, very patriotic and typically Margaret Thatcher, she said uh, on that occasion, we the British people are proud of what has been done, proud of these heroic pages in, our, in the history of our island story, uh, evoking uh, an image of Britain as an island besieged through the years, proud to be here today to salute the task force, proud to be British. All right, uh, here we have Margaret Thatcher with Ronald Reagan. Um, this was to be a very, very important relationship that they had, kind of much ridiculed a little bit by the savage British press, uh, which used to put a portrait rather like Gone with the Wind, with Ronald Reagan being like a red butler to Margaret Thatcher's Scarlett O'Hara. But that was just a, a little bit of fun. The British people really did appreciate the support from the United States and have appreciated the support and the strengthening of the special relationship going back to the war years, both world wars, 
to, so we have appreciated that. Reagan and Thatcher were political and philosophical soulmates. Um, and once when Margaret, who is very outspoken, chastised Reagan very, very severely in a letter. I can't remember exactly what it was about. Oh, yes, I can. It was about uh, the Falkland Islands again, because after the war, America started supplying the Argentine with military equipment again. Um, and so Margaret Thatcher, after spending millions of pounds putting a, a, um, a, an Air Force base down there and fortifying the Falklands so it wouldn't be attacked again, wrote a very stinging letter to Ronald Reagan, which in most circumstances would have severed diplomatic relations. But Ronald Reagan so respected her that when he showed it to advisors and they said, well, you can't be talked to like this by Margaret Thatcher, he, he famously said, well, that's just Maggie. Uh, here we have Ronald Reagan um, visiting with the Queen. You see Windsor Castle in the background. And um, he is one of only two presidents who have been afforded um, the kind of re uh, state visit that he had. Um, that's some, that, as regards the Queen, horses are something that they had in common very much. And so he enjoyed uh, his ride there. And he was, uh, able, uh, in fact, stayed overnight at Windsor Castle, which again was a very, very rare experience after the state banquet. And he followed that up with an invitation for the Queen to visit at his ranch in uh, Santa Barbara. The only other recipients of an invite to stay overnight at Windsor Castle, for your interest, were uh, Ger uh, General Eisenhower and uh, George H. Bush. All right, now we come to Princess Diana, which is the other one of the three women. Now, let me just say the three women of the 80s came from very different backgrounds. Margaret Thatcher basically was a grocer's daughter. Her father was also a lay Methodist preacher, which meant that she really wasn't part of the British establishment. Uh, the Queen, obviously, was very much part of the British establishment, and their relationship we'll explore a little bit later in a moment. Uh, Princess Diana was an earl's daughter. Um, she was a kindergarten teacher when Charles met her, a very young kindergarten teacher. And this is the photograph uh, when their engagement was officially uh, announced. And Diana is wearing the famous ring, engagement ring, which she was showing off during the interview, we're very proud of, obviously. Um, and that ring has been given by her um, uh, to her son, William, who gave it to Kate. So Kate, uh, Princess Kate now wears uh, that ring. Now, in the interview, uh, she was asked uh, how she felt about marrying Prince Charles, and she said these words, which unfortunately didn't turn out to be uh, correct. She said, um, uh, next, um, I feel so secure next to Prince Charles, I know nothing can go wrong. And then when asked about love, whether they were in love, she immediately offered, yes, of course. And um, Prince Charles's reply was more enigmatic when he said, whatever love is, I suppose. Not so enthusiastic. The next picture is, and this will be one of the episodes, actually most of the Photos, pictures we've been seeing are complete episodes of the series. This is a very important episode. Uh, just two years after they married, uh, Diana is holding Prince uh, William, and they are in Australia. They had a six-week tour to Australia and New Zealand. Um, for Charles, this was a very happy time because he had probably been happiest in his life when he went to school in Australia. He enjoyed the Australian way of life. Um, by the way, as does his son, Prince Harry, who uh, is very keen on, on Australia, spent a lot of time out there working with, with veterans. Interestingly enough, I recently had a conversation with uh, one of the clerics at Westminster Abbey, a canon, um, and he knew Prince Harry very well, and he said Australia is so disappointed that 
uh, Prince Harry did not come to live in Australia. They wanted him to take the honorary title of Governor General because they, they so enjoy his company and they so wanted him to go. And he told me that the reason um, that he's not going is because Meghan didn't want to go to Australia. And he also said that Meghan didn't like him very much either. So that's a, that's a little bit of gossip there. But uh, they both, Charles and um, Harry, both liked Australia very much. So episode six, actually, will feature this extensively. Um, Diana took with her uh, a lot of different dresses, couture dresses, and this made the headlines all over the world every time she put on a new dress. So it seemed as though she was continually on magazine covers, and she became something of a fashion icon, um, uh, icon obviously. They estimated that between the two of them, on their walkabouts, they were shaking 2,000 hands a day. The next picture we have uh, is from 1982. It's a newspaper cutting. Um, this, many of you may be familiar with this. May, maybe you're hearing it for the first time. I don't know. But in 1982, a disgruntled man who was actually not a very well mentally, uh, and this is not the first time this happened, broke into Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace is, at the time, and even the years before, was the security was notoriously bad. For those who watched the series Victoria, there's one episode there, and it happened multiple times in the 19th century. It seems though they never did tighten up the security, where the palace was broken into and persons were drinking wine and eating from the kitchens until eventually found in cabinets. Well, this, this man, Michael Fagan, decided he was going to break in, and he did. He made one visit and came out, kind of a reconnoiter, and then he returned again, and he found his way along to the Queen's bedroom. And he, because he was not well, um, he had smashed an ashtray and started cutting his wrists, apparently, so he had blood all over his hand. So the Queen was in bed, and he pulled back the curtain for her bed, she was, sleeps alone, and there he was, sat at the bottom of her bed with blood all over her hands. She reached out for the button, which would connect to the police, but that, she had actually, that had actually been disconnected because for some reason temporarily, so it didn't call the police. She reached to the next button to call the, the um, palace attendants that she knew would be nearby. That didn't work either. So she offered him some cigarettes. He asked him you know, why he was there and had a little conversation with him. He took the cigarettes and they talked for a little bit. Then he, she picked up the phone and to another uh, area of the palace and then eventually palace attendants came in and nothing happened. But it must have been a very scary experience for her. Uh, he was examined afterwards and was never prosecuted, but he did go to a mental institute and he's still alive. And from time to time he regales um, the press with that particular story. But I think it just shows the Queen's uh, unflappability uh, under pressure. Uh, talking about unflappability under pressure, um, this is uh, 1981. Uh, as we said, the Queen is the head of the armed forces, so one of the parades that they have for the Guards regiments through London is called Trooping the Colour. Um, and this is a big ceremonial um, uh, parade, and uh, typically um, it will be organised by uh, someone who is called the Gold Stick, which happens to be a general, or uh, normally a general, uh, in, in cooperation with the Guards regiments, both mounted and on foot, and the bands, uh, where she takes the salute of, of those Guards regiments. It's a very old tradition, goes back a long time. Uh, the Queen will take it on horseback. She will, she's a very accomplished horsewoman. Uh, on side saddle, she, she rides. Uh, in the past, it had been, those big ceremonial occasions 
had been for, this is for the interest of those of you who are veterans, um, particularly of the Japanese uh, theater. Uh, you know that um, Southeast Asia, um, her uh, uncle, Lord Mountbatten, was the supreme commander of Allied forces in Southeast uh, Asia. Um, and he, for many years, did that role. Um, and in one of the episodes, uh, which I haven't talked much about, in 1979, uh, he was assassinated by the IRA when he was on holiday uh, in, in Ireland. And Prince Charles was very particularly upset. Everybody was upset, I think, because it was a savage explosion where he and several people in the boat with him were, were, were murdered. Um, Prince Charles was particularly upset because um, he called him his uncle. He was actually his great uncle, but he had been a, like a father figure for Prince Charles. Um, so as Queen Elizabeth was taking the, um, taking the salute at Trooping of the Colour, uh, a young man, 1819, who said uh, when, when he was apprehended, I wanted to be famous, I wanted to be somebody, decided to take a gun out, and he actually only filled it with blanks, but fired six blanks. Nobody knew they were blanks at the time, and he was very near to the queen. The queen's horse reared, she got it under control, and she just carried on while the young man was arrested. Now, this time, he was examined to see if he was mentally competent, and found to be mentally competent, and uh, he was uh, arraigned in the courts for treason. Now, it wasn't like Henry VIII's time when he would have his he uh, head severed, uh, but he did spend five years in prison, quite a lengthy sentence, and I think that was probably done as an example by the judge. We just didn't want too much of that going on in the future. And now we come to the Queen and Margaret Thatcher and their relationship. There they are in the picture together. Um, Margaret Thatcher never has a big smile on her face, but she normally does smile. The Queen has a beautiful smile, but it's not on show in this picture. But when she smiles, it does light a room up. And sometimes she looks a little bit cross. Um, she's not cross. I think she's probably, she looks a bit pensive there, actually, in that photograph. Now, what about their relationship? Of course, the writer of The Crown would know a lot about that because he... Uh, wrote a play called The Audience. Now, that wasn't a play about theatre. That was referring to the fact that the Queen, every week that she is in London, um, and that's most of the time, except when she goes away for a summer break to Balmoral or when she's travelling, the Prime Minister will call and spend half an hour with the Queen. The Queen will not be telling the Prime Minister what to do, but will be listening to what the Prime Minister is saying is on your mind. So, for instance, with Boris Johnson recently, it'll be uh, Brexit and, and whatever else is going on in the country. So, the, the, Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister for 11 years. So, uh, she went to the palace a lot, sat with the Queen. And we know that they're, because they are different personalities and different way of looking at the world, there was, in the early years, um, a difference of opinion, let's put it like this, the Queen would never say that she should not continue her policies, but aggressively Margaret Thatcher decided to change Britain and to change it very fast. And she had decided that many of the industries there, including the coal mining industries and the manufacturing industries, were out of date and were being subsidized by the government too much. So she took those industries on and said Britain can survive as a financial centre and a service centre, which it actually fairly has gone on to be, one of the world's leading financial centres. But we don't really have in our economy the wonderful mix that you have here, and most countries do, because these industries, shipbuilding and the car industry, were allowed to go to the wall. Of course, that meant that there were a lot of unemployment and I think the Queen was worried about the fabric of British society with so much unemployment going on. But Margaret Thatcher, taking advice from economic advisors, 
um, who were saying this was the thing to do. If you're going to transform the country, you have to put it on to a new footing. So that was a cause of disagreement of views. And also South Africa. Now, the Commonwealth, which South Africa was a member of the Commonwealth, um, was a particular interest of the Queen, because the Queen is not only Queen of the United Kingdom, she is the head of the Commonwealth. And by the way, that's already been decided that Prince Charles, the Commonwealth have chosen Prince Charles to carry on that tradition. Um, but the Queen was very um, disturbed by the fact that Britain was not applying sanctions for the policy of apartheid in South Africa. Uh, but Margaret Thatcher believed that that was the wrong thing to do. Uh, and so that was a source of um, disagreement uh, between the two of them. Now, Margaret Thatcher was a very formidable person, as I found out once when she visited Dallas and I met her. Many of you probably met her in the same scenario. She used to come here quite a lot, as we'll come to later for the reason. But I met her at a book signing when she had her book, which some of you have, The Downing Street Years and The Path to Power. So I lined up in a very long line to get my book signed. Um, and while I was there, I talked a little bit to her son, Mark Thatcher, um, who was not particularly friendly. Um, but nevertheless, that's another story. Um, and because he was prowling up and down, and I thought, no, he wasn't speaking to anybody. So I thought I'd go and have a word with him while I was waiting. Anyway, when I got to the table to get my book signed, she said, well, which book would you like? So I said, and it was a kind of slip of the tongue. I was so nervous upon meeting her. I think I would have been less nervous meeting the Queen, quite honestly. Uh, I pointed to the, her book, which was The Path to Power, and I said, I would like The Path to Glory, please. <laughs> and she bit right back and said, you mean The Path to Power? And I felt as though I was in front of my old headmaster at school. I said, oh, yes, I'm very sorry, The Path to Power, and she signed it. Actually, that book was to come in useful later on to show to her grandson, which we'll come to in a moment in Dallas here. Okay, and talking of grandsons, there she is uh, with Michael Thatcher and Amanda Thatcher. Uh, so Mark, uh, the, the not-so-friendly person I met, her son, on that particular occasion, uh, married uh, Diana Bergdorf in Dallas. Many of you know that. So Margaret Thatcher made many trips to Dallas to see her grandchildren, particularly after um, relinquishing, well, not, well, we'll come to that, how she lost power in a moment. They went to Britain quite a lot. Um, the young man on the right, when his um, father passes, uh, will become a knight, he'll become a, a baronessy, he'll inherit it, uh, which comes down from Margaret Thatcher's um, husband, Dennis. I, I have another personal anecdote regarding Michael. I first met him when he was probably about seven years old, and we, uh, he had, was visiting some neighbors of ours, and he came with a friend of our son's, and he knocked on the door, and this is where the book comes in, interesting, the book that Margaret Thatcher signed for me. And I knew who he was before he opened the door. I knew he was coming, so he come in, and I said, well, I know who you are. And he said, how do you know that? I said, well, because I met your grandmother the other day. How did you meet her? And I said, well, just a moment. I went in, and I got the book, and I said, this is her book. She signed it. I said, he said, oh, right. So then I said, asked him a question, do you play cricket? And he said, yes, I do play cricket. I said, you don't, you're an American, you only play baseball. I was just joking with him. And he said, I play cricket. I said, well, okay, come out in the back garden. I've got a cricket set, I want you to prove it to me. So we took him to the back garden and we gave him the bat and I bowled at him and he played some really good shots with the ball. I thought he'd been coached professionally. So I said to him, how did you learn to play cricket like that? And he said, oh, Granny taught me when I went to England. She taught me on the beach how to play uh, cricket. Um, so uh, I understand, for those of you in Highland Park Methodist, that he was a longtime member. He went to Highland Park High School, became a state football player. So obviously a natural athlete. Um, and I've also heard some good reports about him at senior retirement centers I visited where he's volunteered and, and gone in there. As a matter of interest to catch up a little bit with him today, I googled him and I, he is actually 
um, very interested in acting and charity work. And so a fine young man and his uh, sister, Amanda, is actually also impressed when she came to grandmother's funeral. She read very well, impressed everybody. So they're a fine credit to their uh, parents. And Margaret Thatcher was very, very fond of them uh, indeed. All right, so a little bit more about Margaret Thatcher. Sometimes I'm asked, why is Margaret Thatcher quite, un in some areas, quite unpopular in, in England? And um, internationally, including in America, she is seen as a great leader, um, um, cooperating with Reagan uh, on the fall of the Soviet Union, and uh, a very powerful person and uh, prime minister. Well, the other side for the English people, particularly those in the north, when the old mining industries were let go in England because they were unprofitable, they couldn't really be supported by the government anymore, or perhaps they, they could have been, perhaps they could have been eased out a little bit better, there were large numbers of strikes. And there you see, that's not a typical image of a British policeman that we see in the movies or uh, how they are at their best when they're on foot and they're helping show people around and, you know, not using their, their guns, which they have, but they're all locked in the trunks of their cars. So they have a lot of marksmen as well, but they don't parade them around. But here we have, uh, this is a striker in the north, and there's been some violence, and there was a lot of violence. I was living in the north at the time, and there seemed so many police going around the roadways. It seemed as though we were under some kind of occupation at times. And here he is with his truncheon, charging like cavalry, uh, the strikers there. Well, they would be coal miners who were um, coal miners who were on strike. And then this is the very unhappy end to Margaret Thatcher's 11 years she decided that she was going to change the taxation system in England and go back to how it was many, many hundreds of years ago. And she instituted a tax called the Paul tax. You can see at the bottom uh, there it says Paul tax. Now, this was a tax that wasn't graduated by how much you earned. Every single person in the country, whether they were an invalid living with their um, um, children at home, or whether they were unemployed, or whatever their circumstance, every single person had to pay a certain tax called the poll tax. Uh, Margaret Thatcher touted it as fair that everybody was paying the same amount, but it was seen as grossly unfair by many people. And eventually, uh, towards the end of her time as prime minister, about the time, um, that she was challenged for the leadership. We'll come to that in a moment. Riots broke out all over London. I can remember driving in one part of London. It took me six hours to get home where normally it would take me an hour. And the whole of central London was, uh, were demonstrations and riots. There you can see Trafalgar Square. There's Nelson, iconic Nelson uh, in Trafalgar Square. And you can see the smoke billowing up. Um, and it was a, quite an extensive riot. And it was this riot that persuaded her government and her ministers. You see, the prime minister is supposed to be the first among equals, so all her ministers are supposed to have an input into how the country is governed. Uh, Margaret didn't really lead like that, but uh, they began to think that maybe there should be a change of prime minister. Here is the day that Margaret Thatcher uh, left Downing Street. Uh, with Dennis, her husband, and you see she's all teared up. She didn't want to go. She was forced out by her own cabinet, who collectively, one at a time, went into the room and told her that she had lost the respect, basically, of many of the people in Britain because of the policies that she was um, pursuing. And she couldn't see it, and then eventually she resigned. This is the day um, of her resignation when she is leading, leaving office. It really was um, a bridge too far, to coin a phrase. She went the bridge too far in her radical policies.
support the British people. They, they couldn't take it uh, anymore. Um, and although they respected a lot of what she did, and there are still many people in the Conservative Party that do, it's a very different Conservative Party in Britain today to the one that Margaret Thatcher was running in the 80s. And um, one politician once said about political careers, which is a bit of a generalization, all political careers end in failure, ultimately. Well, I don't think that's quite right. Some of them, some people resign when they feel that they're no longer useful. She was never going to do that, she resigned. She was forced out. Um, but many do, many people stay on too long. And she had been 11 years as prime minister, but she was, after all, um, a, a workaholic. She was granted a state funeral uh, in London, and it was that that funeral that her grandchildren came and read for her. Well, that really concludes uh, what we're going to do today. Um, so these three very different women, uh, which will be seen in the Crown episodes, um, only one of them is still alive today, as, as, as we know. Uh, Princess Diana had that terrible accident. Uh, Margaret Thatcher uh, went into decline and eventually passed a few years ago. She had the state funeral. The state funeral was mixed. Um, she was afforded all honors, like Winston Churchill, yet the people in the streets, there, many of them didn't seem to have, they had a kind of resignation about it, and there wasn't that great um, feeling of great, great loss uh, that had happened for Sir Winston Churchill and his state funeral. However, um, the Queen, whenever she will pass, the signal will be given out to the Prime Minister first, and we don't want that day to come, but we know it's going to come, and the code word for that will be Operation London Bridge. And London Bridge is down. And it, on that occasion, I can only imagine what the feelings of the British people will be um, at the particular state funeral reserve for Queen Elizabeth II. And she will go to join her father and her mother and her uncle, the Duke of Windsor, uh, out at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle, which is her favorite um, castle. Looking ahead a little bit, after this 10 series has been put on uh, this Sunday, then the makers of The Crown have already said they're going to make a series 5 and a series 6. And that will take us up to the, roughly about the year 2000, maybe 2001. They're not going to go beyond that. That's too near for a perspective in a way. But there's a lot of things that happened in the 90s uh, to the crown um, and a lot of things that happened as world events. So we look forward to that. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for listening to, to this. Um, and I hope to bring you something else in the new year. I've been discussing with, um, with Richard Stanford uh, a biography of Sir David Frost, a particularly interesting biography, I think, of Sir David Frost, and I would like to be able to think that I could bring that to you in the new year. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining me today. Mm -hmm.